Pellerinos, welcome back to Reformation Rambles, a series where I tell you all about the history of the European Reformation. Today, I want to tell you all about a mystery that has baffled cryptologists, scientists and linguists for centuries. Let's talk about the Voynich Manuscript. Part one, section one, it's gonna be a lengthy one guys, sorry, not really sorry, the book. The Voynich manuscript is named after Wilfred Voynich, a Polish book dealer who discovered the manuscript in 1912. It's an illustrated handwritten book in an unknown language or a code. So here's what we currently definitively know about it. It currently consists of 240 pages or thereabouts. The numbers sometimes listed as slightly more or slightly less depending on how like fold out pages are counted. Some count them as one, some count them as two. But around the 240 mark is generally where people put it. It also looks like some pages are missing. Most of the pages include illustrations and some of them are crudely coloured in. They show things like people, astrological symbols, and fictitious plants. The writing was done from left to right and the size of the book is 23.5 by 16.2 by 5 centimetres. So it's not like particularly big. It consists of hundreds of vellum pages. Protein testing has shown that it is probably made of about 14 or 15 calf skins. The parchment quality has been deemed average at best for the time period it's probably from. The pages are collected into like 18 choirs or like groups. I, I think of them as sort of chapters almost. And these have been numbered from 1 to 20 in various places. So presumably two have gone missing. But the numbering is consistent with that used in the 1400s in Europe. Which makes sense because in 2009, the University of Arizona performed radiocarbon dating on this manuscript vellum, like what it was written on and dated it between 1404 and 1438. The top right hand corner of each page is numbered from 1 to 116. Based on some numbering gaps, people have hypothesised there were up to 272 pages at one time. And there are people who suspect that the pages may have been rearranged, especially the bifolios, which are like the fold out pages. Multispectral analysis has shown that the paper was unwritten on before the manuscript was made. Some of the pages, specifically 42 and 47, are thicker than the normal amount of paper at the time. It's binded within a goatskin cover. That seems like it's probably not the original cover that the book had from the Collegio Romano, which was established in 1551. There are insect holes in the first and last current pages, which implies that at some point it had a wooden cover. Now that's not necessarily the first cover it had, but it probably predates the one it has now. And discoloration on the edges of some of the pages point to a tanned leather inner cover at some point. Part one, section two, the text. Every page contains text. Most of it is in the unknown language, but some of it is in extraneous Latin. In particular, the signature of Jakob Tepenet, an astrological diagram that has 10 months, um, specifically March to December, in Latin script. Now, all the things I'm about to list are in Latin, but they're not necessarily recognisable Latin words. They just happen to use that alphabet. The spellings have been seen to suggest a medieval language from France, northwest Italy or the Iberian Peninsula. Some words by a diagram of a nude man then the style, which was a high German phrase for a widow's share. There are four lines that nobody knows what they say. When I was reading, it was called distorted Latin script, which I assumed meant, you know, someone had like spilt something on it and it had changed on the paper. No, it, it's just untranslatable. We don't know what it means. And whilst we don't necessarily know what all this Latin script says, it does resemble 14th and 15th century European languages. As for the mystery language, which I know is what we're really watching for, most of the characters are one or two simple pen strokes. People have argued for over a century about whether all the originally interpreted characters are actually distinct. 
A script consisting of about 20 to 25 characters appoints for the vast majority of the book, but there are a few dozen other rarer characters that only appear once or twice in the script. There's no obvious punctuation and the vast majority of the text is written in a single column in the body of the page with a slightly ragged right-hand margin and paragraph divisions and in some places, particularly the last, the last section of the book, there are stars in the left-hand margin. All of the other text is either within charts or seems to be a label on the diagram. There's no strong indication that corrections were ever made although some of the bits of writing seem to have been gone over, so we can't be certain on that, but it seems like they roughly follow the same path through what was written. As well as that, the writing flows quite smoothly. That will play a part in all the theories we're going to discuss. In total, the manuscript has around 170,000 characters. Your hand would really fucking hurt after writing this bastard. This is pre-printing press. It's handwritten. Spaces then divide that into about 35,000 groups of varying length. Now these have been hypothesized to you words, but because we can't be certain of that, they're often referred to as word tokens, if you're looking things up. 8,114 of these may be words are considered unique word types. The structure of the words follow phonological and orthographic laws. For example, certain characters have to appear in every word, so that's like our vowels, for example. Like, there are very few words in English where a vowel doesn't appear, and this seems reflected in the phonic text. And some characters never follow others. So, remember when you were in school and you were taught I before E except after C, but English is a bastard of a language, so it's not actually true. Well, it's mostly true here. <laughs> some of the characters are doubled or even tripled, but not always. The distribution of the letters is odd. Some characters are only found in the beginning, middle or end of words. There are no grammatical markers. So like in English, if a word ends in an S, odds are quite high that it's a plural. Um, if it ends in a D, it's quite high that it's past tense. And this applies to a lot of other languages as well. There's no sign of that in this language. There's no evidence of any grammatical markers that would imply something like that. And that's completely unheard of in any Indo-European language. No word, words have less than two characters or more than ten. Some words, I feel the need to do this every time I say words because we don't know their words, are only found in specific sections or pages, while some occur throughout, which you'd expect, right? So words like and are going to be in every section. But if you're doing a section on space, it's not going to have the same stuff as a section on plants. So it does sort of conform to our ideas of languages. In some parts, the same common word will appear up to three times in a row, which is less standard. Like, for example, we wouldn't write and, and, and in the middle of a sentence unless maybe we were quoting speech. But again, it's still very improbable. As well as that, a lot of words that only differ by one letter are next to each other in the text. And generally they just appear at an unusual frequency when like statistical analysis has been done. Any and all attempts at creating a substitute alphabet where we put our letters in place of like these characters has produced just incoherent babble. It doesn't produce words or speech or language or anything that makes any sense. Only adding to the mysteries of this writing is that multiple scribes may have written it. In fact, they've been written in two very different ways, to the point where two languages are really recognised within the script. So it's divided into Voynich A and Voynich B. It seems like most common vocabulary between them is different, although it is possible different scribes were just writing about different topics, and as a result the language did vary slightly. Like everything to do with the Voynich manuscript, it is up for debate. Overall, the text can be divided into paragraphs, circular lines, this sort of arch, titles, labels, and singular letters. In some places, the text sort of interleaves with illustrations, which leads us to part one, section three, illustration. It seems likely the illustration outlines were drawn first, and then the text was written, and sometimes af sometime after that, paint was added. Using Polaroid light microscopy, it was determined that a quill pen and iron gall ink were used for both the text and the figure outlines. 
the ink of the drawings, the text, the page numbers, the query numbers also show really similar characters. The similarities suggest they were done at the same time. Jorge Solfi from the University of Campinas highlighted that some text and drawings were modified with darker ink over a fainter script, which makes translating it an even riskier business. So like I said before, most of the like, people seem to think that this writing over was just to bring out the ink more. But it is possible that slight modifications were done, especially because we don't understand this language. So maybe they were changing a letter and we just don't know it's a letter. Like, we, we can't be sure. The illustrations are used to divide the manuscript into six sections, each of which is typified by a different style and subject matter. Except for the last section, where the only drawings are those stars in the margin that we talked about earlier. There are a lot of puzzling details within the illustrations that have only fueled theories about what on earth this book truly is. For example, the first section seems to be entirely herbal, but nobody has been able to conclusively identify any of the plants in it. A couple have been identified with relative certainty compared to the rest that are just a mystery. Some actually seem to be a combination of parts of different plants. Some of the pictures seem to be mostly copied pharmaceutical drawings, but missing parts of those drawings have been filled in with really odd details. Now, like I said, like I said the coloured paints seem to have been applied at a later date. The paints are blue, white, red, brown and green. I won't bore you with all the ingredients and the paint, it's easy to find, I think it's on Wikipedia. But in short, they would have all been relatively inexpensive at the time. Both drawings and charts were coloured in with this like paint. McCrone Associates in Illinois, who found out what the paints were made of, said the materials would be expected in this period of history. Some of you may have noticed, or you may not have, the lack of a yellow pigment. This is probably because most yellow organic colorants that were used at that time just fade over time and you can see like a resultant beige in some places in the manuscript and most people think this was the yellow originally. Part 1 section 4 content. So what is this mystery manuscript? Let's break down what we know about each section. There are six sections. In section 1, like I said before, it's herbal. It's made of 112 pages. Each has one or two plants and a few paragraphs of text. This was the typical format of European herbals at the time. Some parts of the drawings are larger and cleaner copies of the pharmaceutical section, which we'll talk about in a moment. And like I said before, none of the plants in this have been unambiguously identified. Section two is astronomical. It's made up of 21 pages and contains a bunch of circular diagrams that have been associated with either astronomy or astrology. One series of 12 diagrams depict the zodiac symbols. Each of these has 30 female figures arranged in two or more concentric bands. Most are at least partially nude. They loved a bit of titty in that time. And each is holding what looks like a labelled star. The last two pages, which would have been Aquarius and Capricorn, seem to be missing. The Aries and Taurus pages are actually split into four paired diagrams made up of like 15 women on each and each of them again is holding a star. The third section is the balneological section. It's made up of 20 pages and consists of dense text interspersed with drawings mostly of small nude women. Some are wearing crowns, some are bathing in tubs or maybe pools and they're all connected by this elaborate network of pipes. Now the basins and the pipes have been interpreted as a connection to alchemy, but none of the equipment shown resembles alchemy equipment that would be used in this time frame. One fold-out page that's labeled as 78 and 81 forms like an integrated design with water flowing from one page to the other. The fourth section is cosmological. It consists of 13 pages and like an obscure circular diagram, mostly made up of fold-outs. One of those fold-outs spans six pages, <laughs> so hard to go home. The six pages are commonly called the Rosette's Folio. It contains a map or a diagram of nine islands or rosettes connected by causeways. And it also shows some castles and what might be a volcano. The fifth section is pharmaceutical. It consists of 34 pages and has many labeled drawings of isolated plant parts. 
There are also objects resembling apothecary jars. It ranges from like quite mundane to quite fantastical style. And there are a few paragraphs of text. The sixth section is referred to as recipes, or realistically we don't have a clue what the sixth section is. 22 pages of straight text broken into paragraphs and each is marked with like asterisks and stars in the margin. So part one, section five, what is it? Now if like I was when I was first reading about this, you're wondering what space and plant and medicine all have together mixed in this one book. Here's a bit of historical context. Astrological considerations played a huge role in gathering of herbs, bloodletting, and just a lot of medical procedures at the time. Most medication was like herbal at this time. Having said that, bar the zodiac symbols and one diagram that is probably like classical planets, everything's an uninformed guess. <laughs> like everything's just an informed guess. None of this is for certain, it's just the current theory. The book has been studied by so many people. US and UK code breakers from World War One and World War Two. The legend that is Alan Turing couldn't even decipher it. Nobody has ever deciphered it. No theories have ever been independently verified beyond like the person whose theory it is. So part two, if we don't know what it is, where's it from? So we don't know what it is, but context clues could help. Who wrote it and why? Well, again, we don't know, but there are theories. And to follow them, we need to go through who has owned this book. The first confirmed owner of the Voynich manuscript is Georg Baresch, a 17th century alchemist from Prague. Allegedly, he was puzzled at this sphinx that was taking up space uselessly in his library for years. So he sent sample copies of some of the pages to Aphantius Kirscher an academic who had published a dictionary of Egyptian hieroglyphs. So we sent these copied pages to him, asking for clues as to what the hell it meant. He wrote this in 1639. It's the first confirmed letter about the manuscript. So as for the first 200 or so years of its life, we really don't know who owned this book. No reply from Kershaw has ever been found, but he did try and get hold of the book himself. Georg refused to give it up and when he died he passed it on to his friend and the rector of Charles' University, Prague, Jan Marek Marcy. And a few years later Marcy sent it to Kirscher, so he did get it in the end. When he sent the book, Marcy also sent a covering letter. This was discovered with the book when Voynich acquired it nearly 300 years later. I'm going to read the most interesting part of that letter to you now. Dr. Raphael, a tutor in the Bohemian language to Ferdinand III, then King of Bohemia, told me the said book belonged to the Emperor Rudolf and that he presented to the bearer who bought him the book 600 ducats. He believed the author was Roger Bacon, the Englishman. On this point, I suspend judgment. It is your place to define for us what view we should take thereon, to whose favour and kindness I unreservedly commit myself and remain at the command of your reverence. Lot to unpack there. The Dr. Raphael that is mentioned is believed to be Raphael Suberhertz Mnishovsky. Definitely pronouncing that wrong, I'll put it on the screen. And the 600 ducats would have been about two kilograms of gold. Roger Bacon being the author is widely disputed. More on that in a moment. The main piece of evidence that Emperor Rudolf may, may have owned it is a now almost invisible signature on page one of the manuscript. It reads Jakob Hokichi de Kapinches. Again, definitely mispronouncing, I'll put it on the screen. He was in charge of Rudolf's botanical gardens in Prague. When Rudolf died, he actually still owed this guy money. So people have theorised that this was either partial payment or Tepinchev took it to sort of take back the money he was owed. Emperor Rudolf was the Holy Roman Emperor and King of Bohemia. He would abdicate in 1611. Minashevsky died in 1644. So the deal would have had to have happened over 30 years before his death and at least 55 years before this letter was written. So Tepinchev, who was he? Well, he was ennobled by Rudolf in 1607. He was appointed as imperial distiller and made curator of his botanical gardens, as well as being one of Rudolf's personal physicians. Many people thought this signature confirmed a connection to Rudolf's court. And that what Marcy was told was true, but like with everything with the Voynich manuscript, things were not what they seemed. 
The signature is now only visible under UV light because it's so faded. But it doesn't match a copy of his signature in a document located by Jan Hurich in 2003. So people now think it was added fortunately later on, maybe even by Voynich himself. After all, Voynich was always very secretive about where he got this book from. He used to just say that he found it in a castle. As for Bacon being the author, Voynich desperately tried to confirm desperately tried to confirm this. He never could. He also concluded for shaky reasons that Gandhi, a mathematician and astrologer based on the court of Queen Elizabeth I of England had owned the manuscript at some point, on the basis that Queen Elizabeth owned a lot of Roger Bacon's work. Side note here, Bacon died in 1294, so at best this would have to be a copy of his lost work. Although that is possible, you know, works did just go missing. There's loads of missing works from loads of famous authors if you go back far enough. So it's not completely insane that someone had copied something and then the original got lost. Now, he thinks D sold the manuscript to Rudolf. And the reason he thinks this is that him and his spirit medium, Edward Kelly, lived in Bohemia together for a few months. And can we just pause for a second and talk about how fucking gay that sounds? Now, I have done no research into whether it is likely either of these people are queer. None whatsoever. But... He went to Bohemia with his spirit medium? Are you serious? Anyway, that was just where my mind went. Maybe I'm talking shit. I probably am. But it's such a thing in history where people are like, oh, they're close friends. No, it's like they were definitely gay together. That's the vibe I get here. Regardless, whilst they did live in Bohemia, it seemed unlikely they ever sold this book to Emperor Rudolf because D kept really meticulous diaries and there is no record of this ever happening and I think if he was selling something to the Holy Roman Emperor that would be quite an important part of his day and he would have written it down. So off to a good start. The suspected author to first known owner line is shaky at best. Now, after Marcy's letter there is no record of the book for the next 200 years. <laughs> It seems likely Kershaw stored it with all of his other books and letters in the library of the Collegio Romano, maybe where it got its new cover. This still exists in a way, but it is now the Pontifical Gregorian University. It's likely it remained there until Victor Emmanuel II of Italy captured the city in 1870 and annexed the Papal States. That's a whole story for another time, but this new Italian government confiscated a bunch of Italian property, including a lot of books from a lot of libraries. So if something was owned by the church, those books were really hastily being transferred to personal libraries so that they couldn't take them away, basically. All of Kirsch's correspondence went to a guy called Petrus Vex. In fact, the Voynich manuscript still bears his ex libris, which is like a label indicating ownership. At this time, he was head of the Jesuit, and the university rector, and he definitely owned the manuscript at some point. This seems like the most likely reason why his personal library was moved. He moved to a large country palace near Rome that housed the Jesuit Gisleri College. Fast forward to 1903, and the Jesuits, or the Society of Jesus as they're now more commonly known, were skint. <laughs> so discreetly, they sold a lot of their shit to the Vatican Library. This sale took place in 1912. But not all the books they were meant to sell actually went to the Vatican. And who bought 13 of these manuscripts? Our boy Wilfred Voynich. Yeah, he likely never admitted where he got them from because these were kind of shady dealings. But he spent the next seven years trying to interest people in decoding this mystery book and finding out its origins. In 1930, he left this book to his widow, Ethel Voynich, which may be a name you're familiar with. Ethel was the author of the novel The Gadfly and was also the daughter of famed mathematician George Boole. She's also the person who told everyone Wilfred was invited to buy this by the Society of Jesus. <laughs> when she died in 1960, she left this to her close friend Anne Nil, who in 1961 sold it to the antiques book dealer Hans P. Krauss. He soon found a buyer and sold it to Yale University in 1969. They catalogued it as MS408 and it has remained there ever since. But who wrote it? Well, the jury's still out. Roger Bacon's obviously been suggested, so has John Dee, Giovanni Fontana, 
an early cryptographer, Antonio Avalon, a 15th century North architect, and so many more. But you're probably still wondering what on earth this mystery script is. The overall impression that most people have is that it's an early pharmacopoeia designed to address medieval medicine. But then why the weird language? Let's break down the theories. Theory one. The first theory is that this is an actual language that died out and this is the only written record of it. And before you sniff about it, there is a lot of evidence that this may be just a natural language. The University of Sao Paulo, led by Diego Mencio, looked for clusters of words and measured their frequency and the intermittence of words. Using this, they identified like keywords and produced 3D models of the text structure. And in 90% of cases, Voynich was similar to known languages. Some researchers determined that the manuscript is more statistically similar to the Mandarin text records of the grand historian than any words in a European language. Is it a lost form of Chinese? Both Voynich A and Voynich B conform to a Zipfion distribution, which basically just means the text has linguistic meaning. The frequency of the 10 most common words is similar to Semitic Iranian and Germanic languages. So is it a lost form from those cultures? We just don't know. It does have patterns similar to a natural language. It's mostly compatible with natural languages and incompatible with random texts. The linguist Jacques Guy thinks it is a little known language because it has similar word length and statistics to Vietnamese and Chinese. Honestly, this language has been linked to most continents <laughs> at some point. One reason people continue to link it to China is there's a diagram in Slide the manuscript where the year is divided into 360 degrees rather than the 365 days we use. And this is often seen in the Chinese agricultural calendar. Having said that, the linguist of Indo European languages for the US National Security Agency proposed it was a hitherto unknown North Germanic dialect and identified a skeletal syntax, several elements of which are reminiscent of certain Germanic languages. I mean, there are so many people with impressive credentials saying different things. It's almost impossible to pick a theory as like the most reliable. In 2013, Marcelo Montemuro, a theoretical physicist from the University of Manchester, published findings that semantic networks exist in the man, like content bearing words, occurring in clusters and new words appearing with each shift in topic, which is exactly what you'd expect. It's unlikely these were incorporated to improve a hoax because they weren't academically understood at the time. Now, I disagree personally with the final part. It doesn't mean it's wrong, but I don't believe it. Here's why. I think just because we don't have a meticulous academic record of theories or knowledge from most times in history doesn't mean nobody knew it. It doesn't mean nobody worked out that that's how our language worked. It's not that big a leap, is it? It would, however, mean if this was a hoax, it would have taken some hefty planning and a lot of thought put into it. Perhaps naively, I don't know who bothered. And that's kind of why I kept this part in. Um, I think it does have some important information in it. I just disagree with the final conclusive state. In 1978, John Stokoe published Letters to God's Eye, where he claimed that it is a series of letters written in Valus Ukrainian. This was fairly sensationalised by like media and the Ukrainian diaspora and in 1991 when they gained independence Ukraine itself. But John's methods of decryption <laughs> have been heavily criticised and his translation has, shows no relationship between like the text and the images. If you are Ukrainian, I'd love to hear in the comments if you have heard of this and if this theory is as popular as some of the things I've read online imply it is. For obvious reasons, I can't necessarily understand Ukrainian news articles. A couple came up, but I don't know, you know, I don't know which sort of papers are your popular ones and things. I don't know if these were maybe like quite niche or not. I'd love to hear. <laughs> I don't know if anyone from Ukraine watches my videos, but on the off chance. In 2014, an applied linguistics professor, Stephen Bex, published a paper claiming to have translated 10 words from the manuscript. Now, if you're thinking 10 words is nothing, please bear in mind it has been 
600 years since this thing was written. No one has a fucking clue what any of the words mean. 10 words would still be significant progress from where we are right now. He used a similar technique to the one that was previously used to decode hieroglyphs and claimed, based on, again, 10 words, that this is a treatise on nature in a Near Eastern or Asian language. He never provided a full translation and sadly he died in 2017. Also in 2017, TV writer, literally people from every field have popped in on this at some point, Nicholas Gibbs claimed he had translated this and it was idiosyncratically abbreviated Latin and declared it to be a mostly plagiarised guide on women's health. This was criticised as sort of patching together existing ideas about the manuscript with a speculative and incorrect translation. Quote one expert, it doesn't result in Latin that makes sense. In 2018, Annette Arbis, an electrical engineer with an interest in Turkic languages, claimed on YouTube, yeah, on here, that the script is a kind of old Turkic in a poetic style. The text was then written as the author heard it. He claimed to have deciphered and translated over 30% of the text. I'll link a couple of his videos below because I found them really interesting, although it's quite important to note that his submission to the journal Digital Philology was rejected in 2019. Also in 2019, these theories never end, they just compound in a way that doesn't explain anything that we just don't know. Gerard Cheshire, a biological research assistant at the University of Bristol, theorised it was written in a calligraphic proto-romance style. Basically, it's a prickly written early romance language that died out. And it's, I hate this guy. I love the theory, but I hate this guy. He claimed to have translated the whole thing in two weeks and 600 years, but he got it in two weeks using lateral thinking and ingenuity. Bamboo's a linguist for over 500 years, but uh, you worked out in two weeks, did you? Fucking biologist, I'm a biologist. Just don't like this arrogance. <laughs> Be a biologist, that's fine. <laughs> he suggested it's a compendium of information on herbal remedies, therapeutic bathing, and astrological reading. It contains many descriptions of medieval plants. Some passages focus on female physiology and mental health and reproduction and parenting. Now, does that sound familiar? It should. Basically, every theory we've already discussed just mashed into one. He claimed it's the only text in this proto-romance language. Um, <laughs> this bit's insane. The manuscript was compiled by Dominican nuns as a source of reference for Maria of Castile, Queen of Aragon. Now, I like the proto-romance theory, but this part is bullshit. Give him a chance, Bob. Why does he think this? Well, there's a fallback diagram on page 158. He's decided to pick the volcano. Okay, fine. And therefore placed the creator near the island of volcano, an active volcano in the 15th century. Experts in medieval documents dispute all of this. <laughs> Lisa Fagan Davis of the Medieval Academy of America said that it is just more aspirational, circular, self-fulfilling nonsense. And the university he works for, the University of Bristol, put out this statement. This research was entirely the author's own work and is not affiliated with the University of Bristol, the School of Art, nor the Centre for Medieval Studies. Cheshire maintained that it's an extinct language that originated around Castello Aragonese and that some letters have symbol variants to show the punctuation that is evidently missing. So those are a, a, a conglomerate of theories about why this is a natural language. So let's move on to theory two. Now, the inability to pin down where this language is from have met, led many to think it's not a natural language at all, but a man-made constructed language. Think Esperanto, but less successful. <laughs> Does anyone still use Esperanto? I've not heard about it in years. A lot of the evidence is like that for natural languages, but it has a much more predictable character sequence than natural languages. But even though it behaves similarly to them, Claire Bowen and Linda Lindemann compared it to both other languages and encodings of those languages, which we'll get to, or constructed languages. The constructed language theory is in part because it's not consistent with a substitution cipher or a polyalphabetic cipher. The peculiar internal structure of the manuscript led William F. Friedman, the leader of the first study group, the people who originally studied the manuscript, 
to think it is a constructed language, although in 1950 he asked army officer John Tillman to analyse the text and he disagreed. He disagreed because while the concept of a constructed language is old, it postdates the manuscript's creation by quite a few centuries, although, again, I don't think just because it's not written about doesn't mean it didn't exist, but that's my personal stance on a lot of things. Theory three. You saw this one coming, we've mentioned it already, but a lot of people think the manuscript is an unbroken code. But what kind of code? Well, there are a lot of theories. I may as well call this video a lot of theories. Now, transcription alphabets have been created that equate Voynich characters to Latin characters so that it's easier to analyse. The letter-based cipher theory is very popular because it's hard to explain why a European author in the 1400s would use such a strange unknown language unless they were trying to hide something. The rough date of the manuscript as well roughly coincides with the birth of cryptography in Europe as like a discipline. Having said that, almost all cipher systems from the era fail to match the Voynich manuscript. It can't be just a basic substitution cipher because the distribution of letters doesn't match any known languages. A small number of characters suggest homophonic ciphers, which is a substitution cipher where a table is used to make up letters, but it kind of means a word could have multiple translations, like the same word could be noted completely differently. I'm not a cryptographer. <laughs> I think that much is obvious. So do bear with me while I'm explaining these. For the same reason, it could also be a nomenclature cipher. That's where a letter is replaced by a word or a group of words. But as people read through and read more characters, both of these were completely ruled out. Now, polyalphabetic ciphers, which use multiple substitution alphabets, were invented by a guy called Alberti in the late 1400s. But usually with polyalphabetic ciphers, the like, shapes or letters occur at roughly the same frequency and this does not happen in the Voynich manuscript. Some people think that it may be a verbose cipher, where singular letters that should be read are hidden amongst irrelevant letters. It's also possible it was a simple cipher and then they sort of augmented it and added a few extra things, like meaningless duplicates, meaningless words, um, fake words. Um, there's also the codebook cipher theory. So the idea here is that the words are a code that has to be looked up in a separate like dictionary or code book. The issue here is it would take such an obscenely long time to write or read this that it seems pretty unlikely, which is a shame because I really like this theory. <laughs> Some people think meaningful text could be encoded within the length or the shape of the pen strokes. So in 1921, William Romain Newbold from the University of Pennsylvania hypothesized basically this, that the text itself as a whole was meaningless, but each letter was a series of tiny markings that you could only discern under like quite high magnification. He thought they were based on ancient Greek shorthands, and within this like second level of the script was the content. He claimed to have used it to have translated paragraphs that confirmed Roger Bacon was the author, and wildly that he must have used a compound microscope in order to see to make the markings he was deciphering. Now, the earliest recorded use of a compound microscope is around 1600 by Zacharias Janssen, but this manuscript was created about 150 years before he was even born, and Bacon had died over 300 years prior. Now, some of what Newbolt worked out implies that the author actually created this technology Basically, they secretly invented a microscope. I <laughs> Supporting his theory, I use quotation marks because I think it's a bit stupid, but it doesn't mean you have to think that. I, I just... <laughs> is a circular diagram in the astronomical section that depicts an irregularly shaped object with four curved arms. Newbolt concluded that this was a galaxy, something that could only be seen with a pretty strong telescope. Stronger than they had in the 1400s, definitely stronger than they had in the 1200s. He interpreted some of the diagrams as cells under a microscope, but again, they're just interpretations. There's nothing really to evidence that this is what these diagrams are. Now, obviously, if this was true, not only would the author have access to advanced technology, the work would be confirmed to be by Roger Bacon. Now, here's why this 100-year-old theory is probably not true. <laughs> 
John Matthews Manley at the University of Chicago pointed out some of the major flaws in this theory beyond just the obvious. Each shorthand character was assumed to have multiple interpretations, with no reliable way to determine what was meant by each one. In fact, his entire sort of decoding method seemed to be to rearrange Latin characters until he had like a word that made sense. So from these microscopic markings, you could interpret basically anything. Now, whilst micrography, so like coding things that have to be looked at under magnification, dates back to like some 9th century he Hebrew works, it's not as compact or complex as these shapes because Again, you didn't have the technology to look at it. You'd have been working on a much lower magnification. And the final nail in the coffin of Newbold's theory is that many of the markings turned out to be artifacts. It was just the way ink had cracked on uneven vellum. It wasn't intentional at all. In 1943, Joseph Martin Feely released Roger Bacon's cipher, The Right Key Found where he claimed the manuscript was a scientific diary by Bacon, written in highly abbreviated Latin that had been put into a substitution cipher. Lennel C. Strong, a cancer researcher and amateur cryptographer, believed the solution was a peculiar double system of arithmetical progressions of a multiple alphabet. He said the text revealed, revealed it was by English author Anthony Asheron from the 16th century whose works included A Little Herbal, which he published in 1550. The last stages of his analysis were fairly subjective, especially the way he selected words to turn into phrases. And of course, given this date, knowing what we know now about the age of the manuscript, it seems pretty unlikely. Greg Kondrak, a professor of natural language processing at the University of Alberta, and his graduate student Bradley Haver used computational linguistics to decode the Voynich manuscript. The results were presented in 2017 and suggest that the language is most likely Hebrew but encoded in alphagrams. Experts in medieval manuscripts, however, disagree. On the note of it being enciphered Hebrew, um, prior to this a guy called Baruch had said that it was enciphered Hebrew by Roger Bacon. Although he also said it described alien technology from the future that allowed you to make DNA with sound. So that's why I've not mentioned him already, we're ignoring that one. A lot of people think the text is actually by Italian engineer Giovanni Fontana. There are only two known manuscripts from the time that were in, that, that are written in like a cipher. Both of them are by Fontana. Also, some of the illustrations in the book resemble some of his. He did use cryptography in his books, but none in the same way as it's used in the Voynich manuscript. In the book Secretum de Thesauro Experimentarum Imaginationis Hominis. <laughs> Pronunciation's fucked, but you get the gist. Uh, he used a simple substitution cipher, which if that was what the Voynich manuscript was, we'd have been able to translate it by now. He wrote this book in 1430 and described mnemonic machines written in his cipher. Again, a simple rational cipher. You see the issue. He'd have had to have created a wildly different coding method for him to be the author of the Voynich manuscript. And I'm not saying he didn't, I'm just saying this doesn't necessarily mean he did either. Minishovsky, the source of the theory that Roger Bacon wrote the manuscript, was a cryptographer and actually created an uncrackable cipher in 1618 and some people think the Voynich manuscript was his way of sort of presenting this cipher and like I love this theory I want to believe it but the dates don't add up. There's actually a very simple reason why a lot of people don't think this is a cipher and that's because the writing runs smoothly. Usually with handwritten codes there are pauses between letters and words like more so than there are between letters as people sort of check what they're writing against the code they're using and this delay between characters just isn't seen in the Voynich manuscript. Theory 4. This theory is actually quite simple. Because it's never been deciphered, some people think the Voynich manuscript is a meaningless hoax. In April 2007, Andreas Schinner published evidence that it is a hoax. The statistical properties of the text were more consistent with meaningless gibberish produced with a quasi-stochastic method. So what's one of those? Well, in 2003, Gordon Rogue produced a text with a table of prefixes, stems, and suffixes. 
did this in Latin and medieval German. And basically you create words and statistically they do rem resemble words and a language. A lot of scholars said it was too sophisticated to be a hoax. And in September of 2016, Rugg and Gavin Taylor actually presented how this method could have been used in the 1400s as like a table. So okay, it could have been done, but why? Were they just bored? I mean, maybe. Much earlier in 1978, Robert Brumbaugh, a professor of classical and medieval philosophy at Yale University, claimed it was a forgery designed to fool Rudolf II into buying it, and this wasn't the first time someone had suggested that forgery played a role in the Voynich manuscript. For example, before the carbon dating, people suspected that John Dee or Edward Kelly wrote it, and spread the still prevalent rumour that Roger Bacon was the author in order to sell it. Likewise, some people suspected that Voynich himself had fabricated this manuscript, because as an antique book dealer he'd know how to make it look convincing. But the dating of the manuscript and the 1999 discovery of Beresh's letter to Kirscher eliminated this as a probability. In Eamon Duffy's words, the radiocarbon dating effectively rules out any possibility that the manuscript is a post-medieval forgery. It's highly unlikely this much unused parchment would have survived from the 15th century like right through to like the early 1900s. It's just highly improbable. It's not completely impossible but the odds are so slim that it's often just discarded. Having said that, Beresh's letter resembles a hoax <laughs> that Andreas Muller once played on Kircher, where he wrote some fake text, sent it off to him, said it was from Egypt, and asked him to try and translate it. And apparently he did. <laughs> Which is sus as hell. <laughs> Essentially, this was just designed to make Kirscher look stupid, and some people have suggested maybe the Voynich manuscript was the same idea. I personally don't think it's a hoax, and my opinion actually matches that of quite a few people. Quote, A hoax appears to require almost as much sophistication as an unbreakable code. Theory 5. I love this theory because it is such a kick in the teeth for everyone who's put so much time into trying to decode this. But the way the writing interleaves with some illustrations led people to wonder if this isn't writing at all but is purely decorative and we're just misinterpreting it. <laughs> A sort of merge of this with the code theory hypothesises that the text is mostly meaningless but there is information in sort of conspicuous details. Primarily the argument is that it's stenography so like for example X lettering on each line or the number of letters in each line, but the writing isn't a regular grid, so it seems pretty unlikely. But if this was the case, it would render the rest of it purely decorational. Now, this is basically impossible to prove or disprove, but it's interest an interesting consideration for sure. Um, Rene Zenderberg actually once said that the letters may be ornaments derived from Arabic, which would explain why they resemble letters so much. And finally, theory six. I don't personally believe this theory, but I like it. <laughs> so in a 2004 book, Jerry Kennedy and Rob Churchill suggested the manuscript may be glossolia or speaking in tongues. It's also called channeling and outsider art. It's when someone speaks or writes in a stream of consciousness because of like an uncontrollable urge, like people in the Bible do this a lot, or because they're hearing voices. Hence it not being a recognisable language. They then went on to use Hildegard von Bingen's works to point out similarities between her works and illustrations that she drew while suffering from such severe migraines she allegedly entered a trance-like state. Is that a thing? Long-term migraine sufferers, let me know in the comments. Some of the most prominent features that resemble her works in the Voynich manuscript are abundant streams of stars and a repetitive nature of the nymphs in the balneological section. Again, it's basically impossible to prove or disprove without like a translation that's trusted, but I just think it's interesting that maybe this could be someone suffering from mental illness and delusions or severe migraines 600 entire years ago. like. <laughs> Conclusions. At the end of the day, we are no closer to discovering the purpose of this mystery manuscript than Beresh was when he requested Kirch's help over 300 years ago. The book could truly be anything. Quote, 
It could solve a major crime, reveal buried treasure worth millions, or, in the case of a Voynich manuscript, rewrite the history of science. We really don't know, but I'd love to hear what theory you guys think is most likely. So please do let me know in the comments. If you did enjoy this, please give me a cheeky like and subscribe, because I have put weeks into this and I'm not even at the editing stage yet. And I'll see you guys soon for a no doubt shorter video. <laughs> Bye! Every fucking car!